Hey guys, Joe Miles here with Osseo Gear. This is the Mission Whitetail Podcast. We're going to be doing a deep dive into what it truly takes to kill these mature bucks. We're going to step outside the box and look at the why for gear, tactics, training, and more importantly, the mindset from over 35 years of chasing these magnificent animals all over North America. Thank you for following along and welcome to Mission Whitetail. All right, guys, welcome back to the Mission Whitetail podcast. And, you know, we, we've had some incredible guests so far. Uh, I, I do think everybody's really going to want to pay close attention, probably get your notepads out. We've got Bobby Worthington with us tonight. Some of you guys are going to know who he is. But um, for Don Higgins to say Bobby is, is probably the best whitetail hunter on the planet, um, that, that's really about all you need to hear. Um, Bobby has had seven, if I'm not mistaken, uh, big deer featured in North American whitetail more than any other hunter. He's from Eastern Tennessee and um, just has quite a resume. and And he is a, a mission whitetail type guy, a guy that that we can learn from, we can all learn from. He's been in the game for a long time. So, Bobby, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for getting on with us tonight. Thank you, Joe. I- appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all well we we again we're really ha- happy to have you T- tell us a little bit bobby kind of I, I know you, you know you grew up in the in the hills there or the mountains of tennessee and and you know kind of when did you get going with, with the bigger class deer and and, and what kind of tripped that switch and, and got you going i uh I, I i'm like a lot of people i got the reading some of the hunting magazines and got to read North American Whitetail magazine and and a few more and I noticed that a lot of the big deer were killed in Illinois and the Midwest so uh, I just uh, you know I didn't have a lot of means but I just uh, decided that whatever it took to make a trip up there during the vacation that I would and you know back then we didn't have all the luxuries that we got now. I run up quite a phone bill making long distance calls <laughs> in the first few years to different wildlife wildlife management areas, uh, public hunting in, in Illinois and I'd talk to the talk to the manager of the park or or some of the game wardens and and uh, like I said, I run up quite a phone bill and then of course I'd Find one that I thought had promise for a big deer, and I'd, I'd, of course, we had paper maps back then. We didn't have no GPS, and I'd mark it on my map and highlight the roads I'd take all the way up, and I'd, I'd write out on a piece of paper, notebook paper, road so and so right on down, and I headed out and got started going to the Midwest hunting public ground, and was was fortunate. The second year I went up, I killed a Killed a real nice deer, and a gentleman wrote an article for North American Whitetail Magazine. And then the next one I killed, I tried my hand at writing, and it turned out pretty good, I guess. And uh, that's what got me started right there. Well, you you've had quite a bit of success at home, where where there you know. Kevin and I are down here in South Carolina, and we've got a ton of deer. We we don't have genetics, and we, we our seasons are so crazy. We don't ever let them get old around here. Uh, but but you've had quite a bit of luck in the south, too, in, in eastern Tennessee, hadn't you? Yeah, I have. Uh, let's see, four, let's see, I think four or five of the, the four of the seven, I believe, that was in North American Whitetail Magazine was from Tennessee. Uh, I, I kind of learned to, I went to the Midwest, and that was a different type of hunting, a lot of flatland up there, and, and I had success there, but I I wanted I wanted a chance to kill them 180s and 190 deer, and, and there's not many of them in Tennessee. I have killed a couple of 180s last year in Tennessee, but there are few and far between. You, you just would not have an idea of <clears throat> how many deer I've studied and and watched grow old and die that never never did qualify for what I wanted to kill. So it's uh, it takes a lot of a lot of hunting and a lot of being in the woods a lot of studying deer to, to get a few, to find a few that would roll that big, especially in the mountains. I mean, even in Tennessee, the, 
farmland deer and same way in the Midwest. They'll they'll probably be 20 inches bigger in rack size than the big woods deer because of the uh, the food they have. So it takes a it takes a lot of endeavor. It took a lot of endeavor back before those trail cameras. I'd have to study them by their sign and their scrapes and rubs. And I'd put a string across the trail and, and morning come out and eat and see if the deer had been through there and if the track was in the scrape and try to pattern him a little bit like that and then eventually see him and when I seen him a lot of times I was disappointed. You know, a lot of mature bucks in Tennessee don't. You know, a lot of the eight points don't get out of the one. 30s and a lot of 10 points don't get out of the 140s, the vast majority, I would say. So it really takes a lot of work to find a, a real big deer and kill it in Tennessee. The ones I've killed, fellas, is a lifetime of hard hunting. I mean, I didn't play around with it. I literally eat my weight and cheese and crackers after them old deer. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. It, it's a lifelong of hard hunting. It, 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 it ain't an easy game, you know, here in Tennessee. And then public hunting and the big woods. Now, it's, it's a different game than the farmland deer. Bobby, what would you say, I guess, separates you from, from you know, you obviously, you know, grew up doing it. You, you've you've taken your, your, your hunting from, you know, regular deer, quote, unquote, if you will, regular deer to chasing the really the, the biggest deer you can find, whether it's the Midwest or there at home. What what would you say is is kind of the number one thing that separates you from the from the average you know weekend warrior, if you will? Well, you know, passion and and hard work. You know, you got to have a real passion for it to do what it takes to kill big deer. Uh, if you don't have the passion, there ain't no way you can give it to you, and you can't give it to yourself. And hard work. And then learning how to do it. Knowledge is, a, most people don't know the value of knowledge. Knowledge is a wonderful thing. But after you learn how to do it, there's a key element that most people miss. Other than the realization that we're accountable then, the discovery of our own potential is the single most significant event in our lives. And when you discover that you're correct, and you discover your potential, that will give you confidence. And only until you have confidence in what you're doing can you proceed with, without wavering, without doubt, without flinching. And you, you'll you get up in that tree when it's cold and, and day after day, even though you've not seen a deer, once you have confidence and realize what you're doing, then you won't have any doubt and you will pursue that hard, and you won't be getting down and, and from your tree and walking around and wondering, am I doing this right? Mm. So once you reach a level and you really think about it and you realize how to hunt, and then you know that that's the way to do it, then you won't waver. And that is so, confidence is so important. You know, yeah. I do a little white damage and salt, and I'm working with Don now, but I used to do it on my own. And every time someone would call me wanting to pay me to go in the woods with him and learn how to hunt, of course, back in my early days, I'd, I'd done it for nothing, but it got to be quite a task. But I'd always think, now this person's been hunting for years, and we may get out here in the woods, and he may look at me at the end of the day and say, Bobby, I hunt just like you, and and I select my stands the same way, and I would have picked the same trees you, you picked. Now, that hadn't happened so far, everybody's been amazed at what they've learned, but that now that can happen. And when it does, Joe, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to charge them double. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize at all because <laughs> apparently they was doubting what they knew or they wouldn't hire me. And I have given them the confidence to quit looking around, to quit wandering, to get in that tree and to hunt. And in, in, in deer hunting, the, the realization of our own potential means that we're going to spend long hours in the tree, that we'll go in every day no matter how cold it is, and that we will not doubt what we're doing. So once you have the knowledge, you've got to realize that you are correct. And, and, it may, and while it's so, the reason it's so important is these big woods bucks, 
they may not come by your stand the first day or the second day or, or the third day. You may have to hunt a week straight, and you may not see but one or two deer in some of these areas I hunt. But if you've got the confidence that you are correct, you won't waver, you won't get down walking around and screw your woods up, you will keep it going, and then it's just out of nowhere. There's not a gradual build-up. Just out of nowhere he walks up and you kill him. And that's, that's the, to me, that's the most important thing, of having confidence that, that what you think you know, you do know. And and I guess that you know that'll lead us you know I'm sure everybody that's listening right now is going okay well then you know what what would be the the things to get you in the right spot and and obviously talking about it on a podcast is obviously a lot different than than actually showing people how to do it but I know you're you're a big funnel guy funnels are or I think what ninety five percent of 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 what you do is get into the really the tight pinch points. Um, is that fair to say, Bobby? It is, Joe. I don't know. I don't know how else to kill a big woods deer. I, I, I have no idea how to kill big woods deer other than pinch points. Now, I do hunt. I do hunt sign if if the time is right, but that sign that deer's corridor is going to always be in a pinch point. If if I'm out scouting for a good a good pinch point and I find a big sign, I'll travel that sign until I come to a pinch point because I want to know where he's coming through more than once. I want to know where two, two or more of his corridors come together. I don't know. I mean, how else are you going to hunt them? Are you, you going to hunt them where they're, where they're eating acres? Well, I mean, a big buck during the rut, he might stop by and munch on a few acorns as he's cruising, but he's not going to, that's not a destination for him. He's traveling looking for does. Uh, now, if, you, if you're in a state where you bait, I'll have to say that that's another way you could do it, but I, I just I just don't do that, I'm, and I wish more people would learn woodsmanship and learn how to hunt using the terrain and using good woodsmanship than the wood over baiting. But I, let's see. I just I just don't understand. People say, well, I don't know where the acorns are on a given year. Or they change, and, and I'm not sure where the buck's bedding. With with the rare exception of maybe one buck, I've never known where the buck I killed was bedding. It's not like the Midwest where you can manipulate a patch of switchgrass and a patch of a good thick trees, and then you've got a food plot adjacent to it. Those, those bucks will bed on points and they'll bed at different places as the rut progresses and they start traveling more and more in their home range without knowing where they're bedding and without them coming to food I, unless you're now you might have an acorn patch here and a mature buck may be bedding 200 yards away and you might know it or might not know it and, and before the rut he may walk in and get to that acorn patch with a, a white oak acorn strong and trees he might get there before dark but that is just a fluke in the big woods that you would have a setup like that and know where that deer is bedding. Yeah. So I just, yeah, pinch, I don't know of no other way to hunt than, than to hunt terrain features that force deer restrictions in the terrain that force deer around them and force, force deer to a certain point, uh, uh, traveling deer to a certain point. That's the only way I know how to hunt. That's, that's, I just can't figure of any other way to do it. And and you've been really successful with it. I I think something that Kevin and I run into is you know we, we are super flat here in South Carolina. Um, we we do we do absolutely look and use you know we've got some urban areas that kind of uh, force deer in, through neighborhoods and stuff like that. But then you know like I've got access to to a farm that's that's really pressured. It's really two farms. It's it's about thirty four hundred acres of swamp cut over flat ground and there's there's you know there's not a lot of uh, of of pinch points you know terrain wise you know we get some creeks we get some a few drainage ditches we get oxbows you know big bows in the river that can can turn them um and and what i've done is is a lot of these hunters in their food plots and bait piles i'll even use those as as you know backdrops to create funnels um, because you know those those bigger deer I've seen won't go through um, a lot of those food plots, and you can use that like a terrain feature. They know that's a danger area, 
um, and, and that's helped, but you really have to look at it from a, from a micro a micro level. But, but what is your advice to guys that, that have like really flat ground, um, you know, swamp ground, flat ground, uh, you know, with a, a ton of pines, ton of oaks. And, and like you say, the, sa- the same thing hits me a lot. There's acorns everywhere. There's thick bedding everywhere. Um, so it's, it can be tough to find a really tight pinch point. Well, Joe, I'd, I'd get in there and look for his sign. Uh, I'd look for his old sign from last year or two and, and fresh sign this year if I was out to predict the deer. And I'd travel that corridor of sign until it intersects another corridor that, and it sits in its core area. And if the big sign is there early in the year, it's going to be. I'd, I'd travel it until it intersects another corridor. And, and you'll find an edge. You'll find a, a, a ditch. Small ditches, you said, drainages. You'll find a creek crossing. You'll find something. Time, if you follow him two or three hundred yards or four hundred yards, I'm betting you're going to find something that's going to tighten him down where he can't be on one side of your tree one time and, and another side another time. Uh, I, I hunt bug side. A lot of times I'll be in the big woods that does have terrain features and I'll find down one point, an uh, individual travel corridor, and it may have a big sign on it. And I may set up and kill him right there, but I realize that when I kill him, that stand's coming out. It's not the same as a stand in a corridor, in a, in a pinch point that's got three or four corridors coming together. I'll use those year after year. And if I'm after a particular buck, I'll find one of them in his core area. But sometimes I've been very successful hunting sign, and, and a lot of times you can you can lay out a scrape line along the edge of, of two different habitats. They like to walk those edges anyway. I'm a big proponent of mock scrapes. I carry silk ties of me, and you can take you can take a good heavy limb, and you can take one sapling. If you've got an ideal place to make a scrape, you can zip tie cross zip tie around that sapling to that limb, and one but one sapling you can make a limb that goes out over an area where you can make a good scrape and with two saplings one behind the other and you sure can but you can actually do it one straight one sapling and i'll make a scrape line right down the edge and you'll be amazed <clears throat> if they can see one scrape to another you can manipulate the way those bucks the way that buck's walking down that edge if you're in a mature buck home range and core area and you know you are make a good scrape line and then I take it. I take and cut a lot of the saplings to keep them tied on that straight line. I, you know, you can funnel a deer if you ever trapped. And most people that Don Higgins was a trapper at one time. Most people that most excellent hunters were trappers at one time. And you can manipulate it where you can actually get a a varmint to put his foot right on a particular spot, and that's where the pedal of your trap is. And you can sure manipulate those bucks too, but. Start out with the edge, something they want to walk, or a creek crossing, and then lead him how you want to with, with a good straight line. That's what I do. There you go. That, now, I know one of the first questions uh, we'll get is, is do you put any kind of scent in your scrapes, or do you just you rake them out big, have your limb there, and leave it alone? Now, now you know, this is – now, we're talking about hunting flatter terrain. I hunt some flatter terrain. Uh, I'm, you know, and I just want that understood that, in hilly terrain, I, I find the funnels are naturally using, but in flatter terrain, this is how I make my funnels and, and leave the deer the way I want. But no, I don't put any urine in that scrape. I'm telling you, if if you've got some big, nice scrapes there on the ground, four or five foot across, take a good rake, and you've got a good heavy limb like they like, one big as your finger uh, broke off there on the end, and, and coming down at an angle, they like that a lot. And and up there about chest to chin high, and and it's it's a significant limb like them bucks like to hit it with their horns and break it up. And you've got the ground pulled out good. If that deer don't pick up that straight and start using it, you're hunting in the wrong place. You may as well pull up and leave. It makes good sense. So you're in flat ground. You're going to create the funnel on the edges, like the edge of a cutover and hardwoods. Let's say you know this got some some deer movement, and maybe you lay a few trees down or or brush or whatever it may be 
to, to even funnel them more, and then you have four or five scrapes in a row, and, and then you get on the right wind side of, of those scrapes, and, and, and that's that would be a good tactic. Am I am I saying that's exactly that? right? And I'll put a tree stand if I get a deer I want to kill using that. I'll put a tree stand on each side. I won't just make the strikes anywhere down that edge. I'll make sure I've got a good tree on both sides, straight across from each other. And that way, if I'm hunting all day and the wind shifts about nine or ten out of the south, like it does sometimes, and I've started hunting out of the north, I'll just get down and go right up the tree on the other side of of, of the biggest strike and. And then I can sit all day long, or I, I, I won't miss any days hunting because of, of changing wind like that. The only time then you'd have to get out the wind started swirling. But that's exactly right. And if if you get permission, or if it's your land, I'm I don't just cut saplings. Hens cut them to block an area. I, I might cut down a might cut down a pretty good non timber tree, a pretty good sized tree, and uh, and block block deer a lot further you know you can block them several yards like that now we're talking about flatter terrain but there is always a way to funnel deer in flatter terrain and there's always something that will start funneling them for you whether it's a creek crossing or a little drainage or a, a edge between two habitat breaks like you talked about maybe it's clear cut and hardwood there's always something there that's attractive anyway and then you just tighten them down even more and them bucks a lot of times, a lot of times, a buck ain't got a good limb to scrape over, and he really appreciates it. I mean, he won't <laughs> thank you for it, but, but he really appreciates you going in there and making him a good limb just to ride high and starting that ground up for him. Uh, a lot of times, they won't. They may be going down a habitat break like that or an edge and not scraping just simply because they just don't have exactly what they need to scrape under. So. You can you can sure you can sure make it appealing for them. No, oh, that that sounds really good. Um, that, that's you know we we Kevin and I do quite a few mock scrapes. We have a lot of luck with those. Um, you know, I even used I guess the Wenzel uh, brothers started the the rope scrape thing, and this is kind of the first year that I've tried that. And um, I, the 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 ropes that I got are just really. Um, They've got that bad chemical smell, so I've really only put one of them up, and I hadn't had any luck with that just yet. But I, I think I need to let those ropes season a little more. Have you ever had any? Have you ever tried any of the rope scrapes, or you, you prefer the limbs? I mean, I'm sure the hey one of the biggest one of the biggest deer I ever shot in the Midwest, 180 high, 180 inch deer was scraping under a grapevine, just a free swinging grapevine. <laughs> About that. And since then, I've took a lot of grapevines. And cut, but if I didn't have a tree or a limb just right back in the past, I've took grapevines and hung them down at the right house and, and had luck with them. So that's about the same thing. But I still use I still use limbs now. It don't matter what you use. That ain't important. It ain't like a deer is gonna a buck. If you've got a nice pawed out place and a nice limb for him or a rope for him at the right house, then that's great. It don't, I don't think it really matters what you use, but, you know, a lot of people will tell you they've hunted scrapes all their life and never helped kill a, a big buck. And I understand that, but you got to remember something. They ain't but a three- or four-day window, in my opinion, in pressured, in pressured areas particularly, where you can kill a buck on a scrape. It's just a very short window of opportunity in, in where I live on up to the Midwest, in my opinion, that window is the last few days of October and the first few days of November, and that's if it's really unseasonably cold. And after that, when they get to running and get locked up with does, that you know they'll run a doe and, and follow her around for a while, but when she comes completely in heat, she'll follow him, and he'll take her to a secluded place to breed, and then he might go to another doe and ride on. And those scrapes is useless. They'll dry up. But well, that's so when your funnel that's, that's when your funnel comes into play. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But if you've got a good scrape line and, and big signs starting to show up, and here's another reason people don't kill them on scrapes. They'll get in there before the buck starts moving in daylight while he's still nocturnal. 
too early in the year before the rut really pulls them into daylight. They'll get in there, say, the middle of October or the first of October when that big sign shows up, and, and they may bump him going to the stand or bump him and leaving or the, the brown sand and just the disturbance that they make in there will run it duck off of his corridor because it's in his core area that time of year, and they'll run him off of that corridor. And then by the time he is moving in daylight, they have already missed the opportunity to kill him. They've educated him that he's been hunted. So there's a very short, it takes a, it takes, it takes some knowledge to be a good spray hunter. Yeah, you got to sure. get them right. I like to make my mock streaks the year before, but uh, in the spring, but if you find a good straight line, get that stand up. I don't care if you have to walk three miles and get your stand and bring it back. Only disturb that deer once and then get out of there and then wait till it's, it's the timing is right. And he, well, if you got a cell camera, you'll know, but I like to wait to the 25th to do the 28th of October, according to the temperature. And then I'll get in there and hunt him, and they won't be but a three or four day period. So most people hunt them straight on into November when they're running hot does, or they'll hunt them too early and run them off. That's why they don't have success in hunting straight. But now straight can be an excellent way to kill big bucks if you know what you're doing and you're careful about it. Mr. Bobby, do you run any cameras on your scrapes, or do you just know? By the weather conditions, when it's when it gets real cold in the time of year, you just know when to hunt them. Or do you do you run cameras and see when those deer? Well, I, I do the... run cameras. I just this year I bought my first cell cameras. I'm just enjoying them a little bit right now. But just put them out. But listen, you don't. You should never let a camera dictate when you don't hunt. Right. It, the first picture you get of that buck. In daylight, maybe the only one on that straight line, and then he's off with a hot doe. You never let it dictate where you don't hunt. You might let it dictate where you do hunt. If, you're, if you've got a daylight picture of him, get in there. But you don't stay out of there just because you haven't got a daylight picture because the first time he comes through, you might want to kill him because he, he may not come through that straight line again. Of course, you want to use your camera also if you don't know the buck to verify it's one you want to hunt. Right. Yeah, I, I like to, I actually use one of your mock scrape tactics um, that I learned from, I don't know which podcast it was, I think it was the Southern Outdoorsman or something like that. Um, I heard you say you put a couple scrapes around your tree stand just to give the deer something to look at, maybe funnel them to it, and then they stop on their own to give you a, a an easy shot without having to stop them. Yeah, that now that's a different that's a different situation. Right. If I'm hunting a straight line, I'm I'm set up on one of the straight sure. on the straight line, whether it's a mock straight line or one of the deer's made. But you're exactly right, Kevin. I'll make I'll make scrapes in the four sides of my stand because I don't want to have to drunk at the stop a cruising buck because then he's alert. And I tell you, I have run a few of them old bucks, and they turn and run just like you shot at them because. They've been drunk to before, and when they stopped, they've been shot at, and and they they they've learned to tell that drunk comes from up above. So yep. I, I like to scrape all the way around my tree, and, and if they come too fast, I want them to stop on their own. And if you know, if I have to, I'd rather shoot them walking than 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 have to stop them. If they're within fifteen yards, it's not a very difficult thing to do. Yep, I had the same, I had a situation about two years ago, my target buck came in at about 8 o'clock one November morning, and he was trotting down a a drainage and then came up a hill toward me, and I was kind of right on this bench, kind of on a ridge, and I thought he would turn broadside, and he ended up walking 10 yards pretty much right under me, and I was at full draw and I made the lightest grunt and I think he was already spooked from something else and he came on glued and just left the freaking left town. Yeah. So the the next year I had another good buck come under me at about twelve yards and I said, Oh, I remember <laughs> I remember what happened last year and I just shot him on the move. I tell you, I've I've done it a lot. If they're fifteen yards or closer, yep. if you'll put your sight pin on the 
or, or if you're shooting a traditional bow, if you put your aiming point on the center of the shoulder and just follow along with them and squeeze it off, then it's going to turn out good. I've, I've worked out years ago, and I've tried it a lot. But uh, this straight hunt is good. It, it's fine. It's, it's a short window, you know, but, but I I really prefer funnels. i tell you, I was with a... I was with a gentleman and his two boys the other day in a restaurant up in Ohio, and we were discussing deer hunting. That's the reason I was up there. And, and he he was telling the boys my approach to finding stands, and we walked out of the restaurant door and walked out on the porch, and it was kind of a hall. There was one door on one end of the porch and one on the other, and there's two parking lots there. And I asked one of them guys, one of them young men, I said, if you – Let's apply something here to deer hunting. If you wanted to touch every person in that restaurant, how would you go about it? And no question about it. I said, he said, well, I, he didn't know. And I said, well, if you go in there and try to touch them, they might move away or someone might be in the bathroom. And I said, what if you just sat down right here on this bench and, and when they walk by you coming out the door going to the parking lot, just touch them. He said, I said, everyone was going to come by you. He said, yeah. I said, well, now, just think about it, though. There's two doors, one over there and one over here. So what if you scoot it on that end of the bench, and when they first come out of the first come out of the restaurant, then you could touch every single individual. So I just think that people don't understand the significance of hunting funnels in the big woods. And, and, and uh, now, we're not talking about a situation in the Midwest where you can manipulate it, but it's just... Uh, it really is an eye opener when I go to the woods. I went to the woods with a gentleman. I met a gentleman here a few days ago, and we was in southern Ohio in some hilly country. And all he'd ever done is hunted bait. I didn't know it was so prevalent. And he said, "All everybody I know, all the way to the and he knows a lot of people and hunters. And he said the only way they any of them hunt is over bait. And I, really, to me, that's not hunting. That's just you know, you're shooting deer. I'm not, if, if the person, if that, that works for them and they're happy with that, that's great. But I just wish people would learn woods and skill. So I went in the woods with him and we was, we was walking on the top of a ridge and I come across a trail that headed off downhill at an angle. And I said, we need to follow this trail. And he said, I've heard bucks don't walk trails. And I said, I don't what you heard might not be right. They'll walk trails in hilly country because they're forced to. That's why all the deer walk there. That's why a path is made, a trail is made, because the many deer do walk it. And we started down at an angle, and it went right across the top of a ditch funnel. And I looked at that ditch funnel, and it had really steep banks, and it headed up right where that trail went across. And I knew I knew something like that would take place because the, the trail wasn't going straight down the hill. It was going at an angle, and I knew there was a reason for it. And I looked, and there was a rub as big as my calf there that had just been made. <clears throat> and I told that gentleman, I said, uh, this is where we need to put a tree stand. And he said, just that quick. And I said, yeah. He said, well, this trail don't really look that heavy. I said, now, just look at it a different way. I said, they has a dead tree falling right here at the very top of this ditch funnel. And I told him the significance of the ditch funnel. And I said, it's got a few, if you'll come down here 10 yards and look, there's going to be a trail cutting across the ditch just a little bit where it's still a ditch. And then there's a trail right here. And then this rub is right in the middle of these fallen trees. Well, that buck kind of worked his way through them. And he walked down there and looked. He said, you're exactly right. And I said, well, it's because this tree's falling here. They're kind of avoiding it. But within 10 yards, if you take all three of these trails and put together, then do you think you'd have a significant trail? He said, absolutely. And he said, you know, I've tried to scout before, and I just didn't know what I was doing. He said, I would have walked right through this spot and never took a second look, never even slowed down. And I said, that." That is, that is uh, what the problem is in most people. They really hadn't been in the woods enough and killed enough big deer to know what they're looking for. 
And when they find it, they might stop and look and think, yeah, this might be a pretty good place, but they really don't know the significance of it, and they go on to somewhere else. That was the first place we found. This guy figured we'd have to go uh, a whole lot to find a good place like that. And it, it amazed him that, that – and once I showed it to him, it just a light bulb came off in his head, and he said, this is amazing. So I said, well, we found that one. I said, now let's go down to the bottom of this ridge and see what we can find. So it was a steep hillside, and it went down and flattened off into uh, some flat woods, and also part of it had a field down there. And, and I started walking it. And I was watching for significant trails coming off coming off the uh, ridge. Well, I found one, so we looked pretty good. And, of course, you got to be careful where the deer slide down a bank. It, it looks better than it is sometimes. I said, let's. Let's walk this up to the first flat, and let's see what happens. I said, now, one or two things are going to happen. It will either fork off and get less significant, or another one on the flat or another trail will come into it because they're forced around another hauler, and it will get much more significant. Well, we went up there, and sure enough, it forked off and went as good, so we come back down. Now, get this. We went a little further. And there was a real steep holler coming down that ridge. The drainage was on top, and, and this was a drainage on bottom. And, and I'm sure the top of the drainage was been good, too. And there was a rub right there. Well, there was a there was a major trail coming down the holler. And then to the left coming down the point was a major trail. To the right coming down the point was a major trail. And then... The major trail that's always at the bottom of a ridge, standing in the woods, come on down a little further because of that steep holler and the ridge beside it, and it comes out too. And they were all, I, I walked around and I finally stepped right in the middle of everything and I said, right here is the spot to make a scrape and to shoot and to put your camera. I said, everything comes within eight or ten feet, every one of these travel corridors of this spot right here. And he said, Bobby, you remember me telling you earlier today about me and my son sitting down here in this, one of these fields, and I've seen a, about 168, 160-inch uh, 10-point, then I've seen a gigantic 8-point that just had everything. I said, yeah. He said, the 10-point come out of this spot and went down there and run, run along this creek. And he said, the 8-point come up the creek from the other direction and went in this spot. I looked at him and I said, and you didn't think that was significant? <laughs> I said, if, if, you know, if you'd have told me that, we'd have come straight here. Uh, <laughs> that would have made it a lot easier. Place, <laughs> you yeah, charge that guy you know, double. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just don't, people just, they just miss the most, they think it's too simple and they think that was too simple and that was, uh, I, there's hardly any coincidences and, I don't understand why people overlook something like that, but he did. Well, let me tell you one more thing here about what we've done, and this, this shows some more funnels. There was a pretty major creek that was on the left side. You had a fill and, and partly woods, and then the steep ridge stays on my right, and there's a pretty significant creek down there about 50 yards on the left to come up to there. And after we left that spot, I done found a tree for a stand right there and after we and I try to get everything on one side or other of the tree you don't want to be in between two corridors if you can help it you want to keep moving on those two corridors have, have one person walk one and you walk the other and get them as close together as you can and then you'll put a stand on either side there where you can have the right wind for, for both of them but anyway we walked on down through there and, and that creek turned and come right again where that steep ridge come off and I asked him I said typically there'll be a tight trail between the creek and the ridge and I said is is there have you been down he said Bobby it's too steep you can't walk and I said oh and I said show me and we went over there and sure enough it was a sheer rock bluff coming down to that water and I said where would you cross this he said Bobby there's a nice flat over here are several, several acres, maybe 50 or 100 acres, just a nice thick flat over there with a lot of deer in it. And I said, oh, 
I said, so a buck coming from that ridge going down to that flat and back and forth looking for does. I said, that'd be actually a good place for one to lead a doe to. It's secluded. He said, yeah, nobody's ever hunting. We don't hunt that. I said, well, how would you cross the creek and get to it? And he showed me. And it just so happened that the best place to cross the creek without any bank was right where that rock, that sheer steep bluff started. And I said, I told him, I said, how long as far as this steep bluff go? And he said, a couple hundred yards. And I said, so every buck going to that flat down there is not going to come off that steep rock bluff. They can't. I said, they got to come off right here. And even if it weren't a creek crossing here, they'd be crossing it. But they're sure going to be crossing it now. And sure enough, we went right in the woods where they was coming off that bank and it was really significant and then there was another trail coming around the side that joined it and anybody anybody could see that once you realize what it is anybody could see it but like I said earlier having the confidence to know that is what it is and not keep looking for something better there's nothing better than those two situations those three situations I just outlined don't keep looking. Know that it is significant and set up. And if you don't see something the first day or the second day, it does not matter. You've got to have confidence in what you're doing once you realize what you're doing. You can't have confidence in something that ain't right or something that don't work. But I know that the way I hunt works because I have been very successful in, in the type of woods and with the low buck population and big buck population and deer population that most people could never succeed in, I have been very successful. And fellas, I just kind of outlined a, 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 some simple facts about funnels and how I go about finding them. Yeah, and, and you know, that that simplifies it, right? I mean, you, you find your funnel and then, you know, you've got to fight your own your own inclination not to spend the time there. You, you, you've got to put the time in and be persistent. Um, once, once you've located that, that tight funnel or that edge, you know, we'll, we'll go back to flat ground, um, you know, that edge that's got the scrape line on it. And, and, you know, if you can drop some trees and create the funnel, you know, where the river has an oxbow in it or, or there's a creek crossing or a, or a ditch crossing or whatever it is, and, and, you know, I guess today, with today's technology, you can certainly dump some, some, some cell cams in there and get real live intel. Uh, but, but you, you know, if that's what you're waiting on, you know, you may miss him. So when the time's right, even if you've got those cameras in there, you, you've got to get in there and you've got to put the hours in the trees. That's, that's exactly right. And, and those cameras will be more significant for you next year than there was this year at the times you wasn't there if you got his picture you'll know you'll know next year that i should have been there more often yeah uh and it don't matter if the pictures that you're getting joe's at night or in the daytime once the temperature gets right and and once uh, a situation happens with that buck that that puts him through there in the day you want to know if he's using that corridor and if he's using that tight spot and it don't matter if it's night or day. I'd rather I'd rather hunt a place that I'm getting that I got three night pictures than one day pictures because it just shows the significance of the amount of time he's going through there. And I'll hunt it there, and, and he'll eventually come through there in the daytime. Uh, just get in there in the spring and late winter, and walk walk your hunting property. A lot of times, even on a big property. There ain't but one or two trees that I would ever hunt from. And that whole property, and it always amazes me that there's usually never been a stand in them. Uh, matter of fact, I don't think I've ever found a tree that, that I've hunted that had a stand in before. And, I, and, and I'll say, well, that is the only stand on this whole property or in this whole state park or managed area that I would hunt. And there's not even a, or the only two or three, and there's not been a, tr- a stand in any of them. So you can't just find a first type place you, you find and, and uh, honey, you got to find the tightest place and the best place and the best situation and you can do that in the spring and fall but here here lately I've had to do a little scouting recently for myself and other people so so uh, you just 
when you find it, you get your stands in. You don't come back in another time, and you get out, and you wait till the time's right, and you get in there and hunt, and you got to have confidence in what you know, and, and, and that that is the correct place. And, uh, and Bobby, you – you uh, Pretty simple. What's that? I'm sorry. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Most people are looking for – but they they got an idea. They got to figure out why Buck's doing what he's doing. I don't care nothing about why. I want to know where. If he's coming through here two or three times, then I don't care why he's coming through. I don't care where he's been or where he's feeding. I just want to know where it's taking place. I don't have to know the reason. Right. Yeah. Yeah. D- keep it simple. A- absolutely. I, yeah. Y- you know, you sent me um, an, an email uh, last week uh, of one of your consulting jobs, and I, I thought it was pretty fascinating that, you know, you went in there and you moved the, a bunch of the guys' trail cameras from where they had them, where they weren't getting pictures, and you moved them to other locations. And then, I mean, within just a couple days, they were getting mature bucks on camera. Can, can you walk us through kind of that e- example of kind of what maybe they were doing? I hate to say wrong, but I guess that in, in the in the short world, that, that's right. I mean, what they were doing wrong and, and, and how you corrected it and, and where you moved them. Can, can you walk us through that? Because I'm sure a lot of guys are in the same boat as, as those fellas. Well, one of them, I'll give you an example. One of them, it was down kind of a, an old dim road there, and they was a straight. And, and they put the camera on the straight. And I said, fellas, let's, let's walk this trail 50 yards, 100 yards each direction. So we walked it down the hill, and, and, it, and nothing happened. We walked it up the hill, and that's the way I wanted to originally go anyway, so I could show them. We walked it up the hill, and it was like three backbones of ridges came together. And every one of those backbones had a trail down. And one of the trails went off to where the straight was. But there was another trail that come around the a side of a hill, a, a trail coming down each backbone, and then one one lead of those four trails went by that straight. And I told them, I said, fellas, if you'll back your back your camera up right here to where all these trails cross and uh, corridors cross because of the drain, it was a real steep drop off on one side. I said, you'll not only get that stuff picture, you'll get more pictures of different bucks and you'll get his picture a lot more often and sure enough they got pictures of other bucks and they got pictures of him two or three times when he did not go down to that stripe he, he wasn't traveling that particular corridor on certain days they got three or four more pictures of him and he missed it. so they would have only got just a very small amount of the of the travel corridor that he w- was actually using very close within 50 yards and apply that to hunting Everywhere I put a camera is where I'm going to hunt. I wanted to put it crossing as many corridors as I can. So if they went down there and hunted that straight, it would have took them two or three weeks to see the deer, or maybe not at all. When if they'd hunted further up, he'd went by there three times, and other bucks too. So you you can apply what I said about the camera to a straight. And another another one they had they had it on. I don't remember if it was a scrape or rub. And they'd got a picture of a ten point. I said, let's follow this corridor out both directions. Went one direction, and sure enough, it was going around a steep hillside and, and just went just a little ways. And a, another trail had come into it where the bucks was going around this little drainage there. <coughs> went just a little further, <coughs> and even a more ma- major trail come up the hill into it, and they all come together to go around a real steep hill on just a little bit of a bench line. I said, now, just think if you had your camera here instead of right down there on one of three major travel corridors. And, you know, and, of course, you could see the light bulb go off in their head. And sure enough, we put it there and got a buck to hand. Never got a picture of a four good buck right there. Apply it to hunting. You'd have killed a good buck right there. And, and on down there, you wouldn't have had the shot. So you can't settle on a site too too quick. You, 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 anytime I find some, something significant, I want to walk both directions off that a pretty good ways. I want to multiply my chances. 
I just don't want to hunt one corridor when I can hunt four or five. I just want to multiply my chances, and, and I don't know why anybody wants one. No, that makes good sense. Yeah, and, and and that's the key is to is is to not focus on the micro little piece of sign, but but look at the macro travel, how they're manipulating and going through an area, and 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 what you can do to force them, or or, or what forces them a certain way. That's right. What ter- terrain features forces them to there, and tell us if I if I find a place on flat ground or even in a funnel that the deer ain't quite funneled down as much as I want, I will always funnel them down. I'll take my saw and I'll go to work and I'll I'll brush I'll brush some stuff up and throw them two trails together. Now if they're too far apart you have to be careful because they might go on the other side of it than what you want. But if not not if there's a terrain feature like a ditch. They ain't going to go down much further. A deer will go three times. He'll walk three times as far around something as he will go through it, particularly something that takes a lot of energy to go down and up like a ditch and puts them in a blind spot. So you can really manipulate deer trails. It's a good time to do it in the spring where they'll get used to what you're doing and uh, already worked out a new trail. But now sometimes I've done that very thing today. I've got a big 10 point here in Tennessee. I'm wanting to kill. I call him Gimpy. I seen him last year, but I was hunting another buck, so I didn't shoot him. But he's a, he's a good buck, and he's got a lot of age on him. And uh, I knew where a big stripe was that was in his, what I thought was his quarry, and I got a picture of it. So I got a picture of him coming through there this year. He hadn't made the straight, hadn't really done the straight, but I followed him on out, and I, I didn't set up too quick. I got to going on him, and got way on over there, and I found where he was going down this ridge. But there were some old rubs, not this year, but they still some old rubs that probably was his up the hill here a little bit. And then there's a ditch funnel that's going down a lot of deer is coming around right down here. That was enough for me to hunt. But then when I got to looking around more, I found some old rubs kind of on top of the ridge instead of right at the ditch funnel. And I, that concerned me because the, the tree stand, the tree I'd picked out for a stand would have blew my scent. That I wanted to push everything on the same side of me. So I got my saw out. I went to work, cut, cut some pretty big thing, trees down with a little hand saw, about as big as my leg. But I got him pushed. He ain't got no choice now. He's going to be here. All the deer is going to be on one side of him. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll kill that deer right there. And so I, I guess you still, it, it'll be, what, a couple more weeks before you, or what is it, the 15th, 17th? What's the date, Kevin? 15th. 15th. So yeah, it's going to be absolutely, ab- absolutely. These deer are pressured. Other people hunt them. They're, they're, they're big woods deer. I don't. It ain't like I can manipulate a... Now, hey, I ain't saying nothing bad about it. I, I teach people how to do this and enjoy setting up a bedding area for deer. But you ain't got that here in these big woods. You 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 don't know where he's bedding, and and you better not get in there and push that deer and, and get in there walking in before daylight and scare that deer out or leave a lot of sin around there. You better wait till he starts that daylight movement. And, and I've noticed unless it's a very rare deer or you're set up a lot closer to the bedding area than you realize, then you might see them in daylight early in October. But these pressured big woods deer, it usually takes the rust to get them on their feet during daylight. That's how they survive as long as they have in pressured areas. I like to wait about the 25th to 26th, and if it turns warm, I'm not going out then. You may actually, I have missed the whole year of the opportunity of hunting a big buck's corridor like that just because the weather turned warm and it was warm until the does come in heat well that's one thing we can't control the temperature temperature is 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 what gets them big bucks on their feet when the timing's right and we can't control it and if you get a warm warm spell during the wrong time then it can it can affect you and you you might not succeed and don't blame yourself or don't think you've done something wrong. There are circumstances that's out of our control that can affect our deer hunt from one year to the next. So you got to keep that in mind. Well, that makes all that makes a lot of sense, and and I know we're going to get a ton of feedback from guys, uh, Bobby, and and 
you know, to I guess to to summarize here, if you will, and and I don't again, I don't want to want to put words in your mouth, but but I, I mean the, the philosophy I'm seeing is stay out of your areas until it's time for the deer to start moving in daylight. Hunt your tightest possible pinch points with historic sign and current sign, if possible, on one end or the other end, and and then be persistent in those areas and and actually don't talk about it, but actually get in there and do it and hunt, hunt, hunt. Joe, that's exactly right. It is as simple as that. And why people don't succeed in something that simple is, number one, they might not know what a significant funnel is, and number two, they lack the confidence to realize that they're they're right, and and that's that's two of the biggest things. But that's exactly right. In a nutshell, you have it. And there's no better place on earth to hunt than a tight funnel with big sign made at different times. Uh, I, it, that's hunting the big woods. Now I I realize the farmland is different, and that's a, it's a joy to hunt places like that. It's a pleasure to hunt the big woods too. It's just a different type of hunting. And if you're hunting over bait, that's the one exception in the big woods that would break this deal on the uh, on the way to way to the rut right. If you if you got a big bait pile, sometimes them deer kind of migrate to it, and they'll be bedding not too far away, and you might kill one early in October uh, over that bait. That's fine if you want to hunt that away, and you do it that away. But I'm talking about big woods deer, pressure deer, and, and with no specific place like a bait or something that they're feeding in. They're just browsing as they go and picking up acorns. That's the type of deer that I enjoy pursuing. Mr. Bobby, I got, um, not to drag this along too much longer, but I, I got a lot of, or Joe and I got a lot of uh, public land probably within an hour of a drive in pretty much every direction you could go and it's all different type of terrain if we go north um it's really hilly almost like southern ohio and then if we go south kind of of uh columbia from us it's it's all flat um so i'm when i check out these new areas a lot of them i've never stepped foot on um whether it be hilly or or flat um, just in general, what what is one thing maybe on the map or or something when you not even looking at the map, you step foot on the property? Oh, give me one second. It just said limited space. Okay, sorry, on. I thought our our card was run our cards running out of space. But anyway, what's the first? What's the one thing or first thing that you look for on a stepping foot on new property? Say like this time of year um, during the season. Well, this time of year, a buck that's on his feet must, especially a mature buck, is going to be making sign. Later on, when he gets to going hard, looking for them first does, he won't. But right now, he's going to be making sign. I don't know what, if, if there are some back roads, I'd either drive or walk as many back roads as I could, and I'd be looking for one or two things. I'd be looking for a, a, a trail. The trails are there for a reason. Deer converse across top of traffic because of a reason or i'd be looking for big sign <clears throat> and if i if i found a trail i'd follow it out each direction a good way i'd want to know if it's going to get heavier or, or, or get lighter and if it got lighter i might follow one of the folks out more and something else may come into it i want i want as many deer pushed on the vet because of the top of traffic as possible and when i find that then I know I found it, and I'll have faith in it. And particularly if there's, if it's this time of year, that there should be some good sign on it. If it's in a buck's core area, if it's not in a buck's core area, they won't be. And and I, some of my best bucks I've killed is not a rubber scrape of inside. Or I may be looking for big sign, and if the sign is significant enough, I try to find the deer's track. Always, I want to know a statue, and then I'll try to, I'll try to. Pull that sign. I'll, I'll keep following the sign. I'll try to pull another another travel corridor of that sign together because 
that buck ain't going to just be walking one corridor. He won't walk through that area the same way every time. If, 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 you, if you don't think I'm right, put a camera on or set on it. You know, you may sit several days before you come see. Well, he's still traveling through that. That's right. So I want to try, try to pull a couple of his corridors together and, and see what it looks like there. Yeah, and I now, think. I want, I want to look, fellas, if I've got several places, uh, managed areas in different directions. I don't know. I'm I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I don't know if it's soil content or if it's genes, but some areas will typically produce giants, and they may be an area one county or two counties over that the bucks are mature, and they'll never get out of the 130s and, and or 140s the average deer, and they'll they'll grow and die. <clears throat> I want to investigate <clears throat> and find the areas that that I'm considering. I want to find the one of those areas that that the most good deer is killed out of, and I think genes has a lot to do with it. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story. Years ago, I was hunting a wildlife manager in Illinois, and I got to know the manager quite well. And I noticed that all the deer were nine points. Hardly ever would I see a ten point or eight. And I noticed on the right side was eight, and on the left was ten. It was a four and a five. So I asked the manager, and he said, Bobby, it's been like that ever since I've been here. He said, I don't know why. And one day was going hunting me and him, and he put out an old set of antlers that was dark, and, and I could tell they were really old. And I got to looking at them, they were sawed off. And I asked him, I said, Fred, where did you get those rattling antlers you've got there? And he said, well, let me tell you a story. He said, years ago, they stocked some deer in here from Wisconsin, and my dad wasn't the manager here, but he, he worked here as a ranger and he said he helped them with that stalking and he said they released one buck and four does and he said they had sawed the horns off that buck on the trailer before they drove down here with it so it wouldn't go and hurt the does and he said this is them horns <laughs> and i said well you know it's the same nine point that we're seeing and the, the same side i said uh <laughs> it's it, it's got to be in the genes it's it's significant so I try to look for an area that produces good deer typically, and I think genes have something to do with it. The soil content, the minerals in the soil may also. But but if I'm like you guys, got several managed areas, I'd want, I'd want to hunt the one that's producing the best stuff. That makes yep. good sense. Yep, you're right. And, and Joe and I have actually um, looked through the record book and, and found some of the, the top counties for the most entries. So um, that just kind of, I guess – quantifies what what we've been saying yeah for lack just of a better word puts the exclamation point yeah, on top right, of the thought right well bobby we you know we're closing in on an hour here and and really appreciate you taking your time on a saturday night and um i, I think maybe something we could do and i'll talk with don about this is if if you know we we get some time after season's over you know, maybe get a property somewhere and, and, and get some, some guys together and, and get with Don, obviously, maybe get Steve Shields, his his photographer, and, you know, or videographer, get together and walk a property together and, and point some of these features out. Do you think that'd be something we might could get together and do? Why, Joe, we, we might. I've always tried to stay kind of out of the public eye. You know, jealousy is a pretty strong emotion. It's, it's it's stronger than love, in my opinion. And you get a, the more you're in a public eye, the more you get these guys that uh, just kind of want to do things and they they want to cut you down. But but we'll yeah, I would consider talking about that, and and we'll see what what transpires. I want to tell you something else, <clears throat> Joe. I've got some of your camouflage, and I tell you, I've been pretty fascinated by it. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, when my dad was a little lad, there was a gentleman named Will, and he was born into slavery. And Daddy asked him if he had any, or some other gentleman did that was older than one. I don't remember. I just remember Daddy telling about it. He asked him, he said, is there any advice you can give me about life? And Will said, yeah. He said, he said if, you, if you're going to buy something, he said, don't never buy nothing good. He said, I always get something bad. He said, if you're going to get molasses, he said, get bad molasses. He said, it'll last you a lot longer. Well, I want to tell you, <clears throat> I've decided that philosophy is not 
correct. I have, all my life, I've tried to, never had a whole lot of means, and I've tried to buy stuff that was uh, more economical, and I'm, I finally learned something. Usually the time I buy it once, and then it tires up, and I think, well, I, I just got a bad one, so I'm going to go back and get another, and then I go back and get another, and it tires up, and then usually I dish out my money and buy a good quality product, so I paid for it two or three times. I want. I just want to say that I've never seen uh, better apparel than than. And you ain't, you ain't mentioned this, and you didn't know I was going to talk about it. And I know you don't want this to be an advertisement, but I have never seen better apparel than, than your camouflage. And and I'm just amazed by the workmanship. Now I haven't had a chance to to give a good test to the pattern, but me and you both know if you're in a good brushy area and, and a, a plaid flannel shirt would do just as good as anything but if you're out in the open you're going to have to have some good camo and and i like the way this looks but i'm not going to testify to that but i will testify to the workmanship i bought cheap camo and get a thread start pulling and the whole darn thing fall <laughs> off of me but i'm <laughs> i tell you what I was doing yesterday. I was scouting, and I was walking up the side of the mountain, and I had a pair of your pants on. Now, this is, this is, this is probably going to be interesting to you. Well, as I was going to the mountain, I was heating up, and, and there's a little breeze blowing, and I got the feeling a grill stole my right upper thigh. And I said, what in the world have I snagged a hole in these pants? And I knew I had because of the quality of them. And I got to looking, and they were some of that fishnet material right there blowing on my upper thigh. And I thought, well, that's one of them little pleasure blessings you get because <laughs> I was sure he up it, and that's cooled me off. And, and I thought, well, if I was sitting in the tree, though, and it was cold, that'd probably be pretty rough on a man. So I got to feeling around there, and guess what? I found a sipper, and I sipped it up, and and – then I sift it back down, and I found it on the other side, and I sift that down, too. And for some reason, if you get iron on the side of your upper thigh, if you start heating up, and I guess you guys figured this out, if you get some iron blown on it, it'll cool you off. So I just imagine sitting in a tree stand and having that sift up because I was cold, and then it warms up during the day, and or I have to get down and trail up a deer and just sifting that right down. Now, I know you guys... <clears throat> has got some other, I think you call this stuff innovation. And I know you've probably got some more of them. And I want to be happy at different times. I ain't going to get my clothes out right now and find all of them. I want to find them in different days. I just thought I'd mention that. Well, we and sure I, appreciate that. Amazed at the workmanship and, and some things I'm finding out about them. So I just, I, I know you don't want to be an advertisement, Joe, but I got you camouflaged and I really do like a lot of the stuff I'm seeing. Well, well I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I'm really excited to, to get with you at the end of the year after you've had a chance to get up in the tree and have some deer around you. I, I think you're going to be really, really shocked at how well the pattern works. You know, we, we used great horn owls and eastern screech owls to um, to develop that pattern, and it's got their coloring and, and, and their shadows and depth and, and feather patterns in that in the pattern. So I think you know as much as you spend time out in the woods, I know you've interacted with owls before, and, and just the way they're camouflaged, and that we just we just took the pattern from nature. So I'm really excited to to get feedback from you after the season. Well, when when I find out about that and how good it works. You know, good camouflage is really important because sometimes, Joe and Kevin, there'll be one particular tree you have to hunt. And I'll find that tree. And I'll, I'll funnel things together until I find that tree. And that tree may look like a telephone pole. But I don't care. A lot of people want hunting for nothing. No, I'll get over here another 20 or 30 yards. And that's where they go wrong right there. Yep. And they ain't going to be happy about it. So, a lot of times, I don't care how that tree looks, how big around it is, or if there ain't a limb on it, I'm getting in the tree I got to be in. So it, a good camouflage is really important. Well, that is great, and I, I'm super excited to, to to hear you know at the end of the year what you think about it and 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 you know how it stacked up with some of the stuff you used in the past. But um, I, I'm I'm so glad we were able to get together tonight, Bobby. 
again, thank you so much for taking your time, uh, you know, on a Saturday night to get up with us, and hopefully we can do this again down the road. Thank you, Joe and Kevin. I I always enjoy talking about deer and killing good deer and and maybe helping somebody a little bit through through what I've learned over the years. So I appreciate this format to do that. Thank you, sir. You all all have a good day. Mr. Bobby, I I just wanted to say one thing. I I listened to a bunch of your podcasts on on different um, different shows, I guess. And uh, one of the things you said was when you first started trophy hunting, you decided you needed to start shooting a bunch more does to get the the reps in. And I took that that to heart a couple of years ago. And a lot of the local does are pretty mad at you right now. <laughs> Good deal, and and that'll help you close the deal on a big buck. Yep. There, there's something that I can tell you. You know, I I, I done one article called closing the deal. But and in it I say that there's I don't care you can listen to me a hundred times and it'll help you what I say but but it won't really you can't apply some things until you actually do it. Yep. And I I heard Terry uh, Don's buddy, a real great guy. I'm not got a pleasure meeting him yet, but I heard him say on a podcast here recently. I just started listening to these things. The first thing I ever heard, actually, I, I, it was me talking on it, but I started listening to him here, and Don's got a great podcast and does a lot of great work. But I heard Terry the other day say that he missed a big buck because he did not stand up. If he'd been standing, he would have killed him. And, and on that Closing the Deal podcast, if you remember, I said, I don't care if it's a target deer or a non-target deer. As soon as you see a deer approach it, you stand up and, and never try to shoot a deer sitting down because he may change directions, and now you've got to stand and, and try to get around. He's on the wrong side of the tree. So, yeah, it, 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 it's very important to get experience like that, not just to hear somebody say it, but to actually get out there enough to, to, to find out for yourself it's true. Yep, yep, 100%. Well, Bobby, thank you again, buddy, and uh, we'll be in touch soon and, and have a good rest of your weekend and uh, keep us posted on how your season goes. I'm headed to Kansas early in the morning. to, to yeah, I know we had to reschedule, and I appreciate you doing that, and, and I'm going to go out there. This this buck, you know, it's unusual for me to hunt in October this early, but uh, he is. Day, I've got some text cameras out there, and he is actually coming through a funnel several times uh, in daylight. So I, I think I can get on him um, here. It's going to get down in the 20s. Uh, we, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, so uh, c- c- could have an opportunity at him. Oh, good luck! I, I certainly hope, I certainly hope you get him. And and no matter what, uh, you know, ninety percent of the deer may not travel this early. But it's hey, if you see one doing it, or you get a picture of one doing it, then you just you you just you don't overlook something like that. You know, you get in there and get after him. I sure hope you get him. And I know you're a good hunter, and I I feel like I feel like that in a situation like that, you're going to. Well, I hope so. I, I sure appreciate it, and I'll definitely let you know if we get him. And again, Bobby, thank you so much for coming on, and, and, and hopefully we can do this again down the road. Thank you, Joe. I've, I've enjoyed it. Have a good night. Have a good thank yes, you, sir, Mr. You Bobby. Too.